Welcome to another program in the art of living. On the occasion of the Rebbe's birthday, which is on the 11th of the month of Nisan, there is here a subject which the Rebbe actually spoke publicly but was also contained in brief form in a letter to President Reagan. This was in 1981. It was the Rebbe's 79th birthday and uh, the president was recovering from the attempted assassination. Let's read what the Rebbe has to say. Gratitude, the acknowledgement of good, is an important obligation, whether to God or to man. My heartfelt thanks and appreciation are extended to all those who have sent their best wishes on this occasion. Special recognition must be paid to the President of the United States of America, who, notwithstanding his present state of health, has written to convey his congratulations and best wishes. The elected leader of a country is the instrument through whom the divine works to do good. And as such, the President deserves and has my deep gratitude for his kind thoughts and sentiments and my blessings for a full and speedy recovery. The President has a mission and task entrusted to him by God to work for the good of America and of all Americans. We can rest assured that the responsibilities given to the holder of an office, any office, are matched by the capabilities given by God to the holder. He need only have the determination to use those capacities to their fullest. This trust in God, a trust strong and full, will undoubtedly lead to his full recovery and help him achieve the immense tasks and goals that lie ahead. Let's reflect upon the assassination attempt, which, thank God, failed. An analysis of the cause of what, by all decent people, must be regarded as a shocking and incomprehensible act. It is fashionable to espouse the theory that the root cause of most, if not all, crimes is poverty, with its resultant feelings of bitterness, deprivation, and a thirst for revenge. The validity of this theory is somewhat dubious. Poverty often is the impetus to rise, the desire to overcome deprivation, leading to greater moral strength and positive action. But in this case, the theory is clearly not true, for the assailant came from a wealthy family and lacked nothing. Clearly, poverty was not the cause, and the explanation must be sought elsewhere. We need not look too far. Unfortunately, the source of the trouble is not confined to this particular individual, but to all too many people. The blame can be laid squarely on the education he and many other children have received and continue to receive. An education which imparts only knowledge gives no direction as to how that knowledge is to be applied usefully, constructively, and such an education is not worthy of its name. Technical skills are essential instruments for later life, but when unaccompanied by education in ethics and morality to form character, to learn right from wrong, then they are dangerous tools. Although they may be used for good, they can also be destructive. The failure to instill in children an awareness of God, an omnipresent real God who sees and judges, has inevitably produced the selfish, egocentric lifestyles so prevalent today. The desistance of parents and schools from intrusion into a child's life, replaced by blanket permission to run free of any moral restraints or limits, has seen its tragic results. It has created an entire generation of unbridled passions, the inevitable offspring of an amoral and value-free education. Rather than instilling children with the knowledge that the foundation and aim of their learning is to equip them to be decent and productive citizens, schools propagate the pathetically inadequate warning to refrain from crime in order to avoid punishment. The inevitable result is the belief that one need not necessarily refrain from wrongdoing, but only be smart enough to avoid being caught.
Status is measured not in terms of achievement, but in the amount of daring and brazenness that one can bring to any adventure. The greater the crime, and hence the greater the emphasis on personal fulfillment as opposed to social obligations. The greater the egotistical thrill. Indeed, the premise that only the individual matters leads such people to express their ego, their individuality, in precisely those actions that will damage and hurt others, specifically to assert that all others mean less than nothing. And after all, is he not the only one who counts? The assumption of parents, whether rooted in ignorance or criminal indifference, that a child is permitted to give free rein to his or her natural appetites, has resulted in children who have grown up wild and unrestrained, bereft of any cognizance that the world was not created for their exclusive benefit. The tragic comedy of liberalism gone wild and of the indifference or even fear of attempting to shape children's character has aroused the specter of a generation so remote from all accepted values as to make such acts as the assassination attempt foreseeably commonplace. A grim picture indeed, but to remain silent would be a sin far greater. The seeds so carelessly planted have sprouted and their crop is bitter. Young people are not fools and the unspoken word has sunk in and the not so unspoken. Whether told outright or given tacit consent, this generation has been allowed to assume that they can do and have whatever they desire. Should children receive some smattering of knowledge about God, haste is made to point out that in the United States there is the concept of separation of religion and state. Education, the knowledge which will assure them success in life, is separate from belief in God. This is a sad joke. Separation implies at the very least that there are two subjects which are taught separately, separate hours for religion and secular instruction. But instead, no time at all is allocated for prayer in public schools, and no finances are given for religious instruction. So entrenched is this bias that tax rebates are refused to parents whose children attend religious schools and even support for non-religious components of the schooling, such as travel, health, secular subjects, is withheld from religious schools. To add in insult to injury, the above is wrapped in an aura of sanctity, holding high the banner of tradition. The founding fathers of this country were refugees from religious persecution, and they fled to and founded this country precisely so that they might practice their religion, seeking to ensure freedom of religion for all. And after fleeing such persecution, they certainly had no intention of preventing the mention of God in a classroom. A tragic irony indeed that their intentions of separation of religion and state in education would come to be perverted to mean exclusion of religion from education. The results are clearly evident, the lawlessness, the chaos, the non-productive, useless lives. But instead of attempting to fix the cause, only the symptoms are treated. Why wait for the patient to become critically, critically ill when one can act to prevent the sickness in the first place? And this is a disease which infects all, rich as well as poor. In fact, the rich are even more susceptible. As was evidenced by the assassination attempt, the assailant had no financial problems in acquiring the weapons and his spoiled, indulged childhood had left him free of inhibition in seeking to gratify his unrestrained wants. But if this education had been based upon a belief of an omnipresent, omniscient God, he would never have contemplated such an attempt, just as surely as if he had known that the Secret Service were watching his every move. The implementation of such a program of education is too vital and urgent to be left to the usual snarl of legislative red tape of committees, votes, and referendums. It demands immediate action. 
The resolution and decision to do so was made thousands of years ago. In the Bible, it states that God is the creator of all and that he has commanded respect for parents and has prohibited robbery, murder, and even coveting. An education grounded on these principles will ensure a life lived fully and productively, benefiting the individual and his society. It is this very point which the President stresses in his letter of greeting, praising the intense efforts made on behalf of education, an education aimed at making children into decent and productive citizens. The importance of a proper education cannot be too highly emphasized, and indeed a special education day has been enacted to stress this. An education which provides not only knowledge, but also the moral training to make possible the proper use of that knowledge. This education must start from the very early years when those vital first impressions are made, because many parents today unfortunately do not or cannot provide such an education. The responsibility to do so devolves on the school system. A simple, brief, non-denominational prayer by children at the beginning of each day, affirming their belief and trust in God, is the best and most effective first step. Sincere, honest words spoken from the heart by people who stand as living examples of those who believe and trust in God will go far in inspiring children to live up to the standards set by the Bible. The implementation of these suggestions will do much to assure the peace of mind and peace of body so essential to the well-being of society. The result in peace between people and nations will make this a world truly fit for God's presence. The preparation for the final redemption through our righteous Mashiach, when, as it says, I will convert the people to a pure language that they may all call upon the name of God and serve him in a common effort. The Rebbe mentions here a non-denominational prayer. During the years that the Rebbe promoted this project, he suggested that a possible prayer, non-denominational and acceptable to all and already authorized by the country would be the simple prayer, in God we trust. In later years, the Rebbe suggested that a moment of silence might be even more effective since it would avoid a lot of conflict. Everybody could think their own thoughts. Parents can prepare their children for the moment of silence and tell them what it is they should contemplate at the beginning of the day when the school gives them that moment of silence. And although the Rebbe says here that parents may not be prepared or may not have the ability to instruct their children in moral issues, the main point of the Rebbe's argument is that even if the parents were to stress moral uh, values, the fact that the school ignores it, the fact that the school does not include and does not support those values, to the child sends the message that what the parents are telling them is the personal opinion of the parents, a personal hang-up of the parents, but that it's not really important. And so if the school doesn't support what the parents teach, then the parents' teachings are wasted or lost on the child. And so the moment of silence would involve the parents and actually force the parents to provide the child with a thought, with a proper thought, because the child is going to ask during that moment of silence, what am I supposed to think? And so it has a double benefit in that it gives the child a moral thought with which to begin the day, and it also involves the parents and forces them to come up with a moral teaching for the child. The idea that the United States has on its coins, on its uh, currency, the words, in God we trust, was something that the Rebbe was very proud of as an American. And whenever a foreign dignitary, a rabbi, would come to America, the Rebbe would point out with great pride 
that on the, on the dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. And the Rebbe would emphasize the word trust because belief in God and trust in God are two different things. And trust in God is, in a sense, even greater than the belief in God. Here's what the Rebbe had to say on that subject. In a democracy such as the USA, an orderly transference of government is affected through the electoral process. The choice made by the people in the polling booths decides who will occupy the highest office in the land, the presidency, and thereby ensuring a smooth and peaceful transition from one administration to the next. Yet a disturbing trend has been evident in past elections. When the incumbent in the Oval Office is the defeated candidate, his defeat has triggered a less than noble response. It is seized upon as an opportunity to rejoice in his discomfort, to gloat over his downfall. Stripped of all his power, such critics fear no retaliation, nor can they expect to gain any favors. And so they indulge in this pastime of rubbing salt into the wound, gleefully recounting any errors made during the former president's administration. This is not the way of Torah. Notwithstanding any past mistakes, Torah bids us to be grateful, to acknowledge those good things which were done. In the eyes of the Torah, to be ungrateful is a despicable thing, unworthy of human beings. And in the past administration, the outstanding achievement was the prevention of war. There were instances in the past four years which, but for the endeavors of the president, could easily have led to war. Not only did he thus save millions of Americans from the horrors of war, but in all probability, the rest of the world as well. And for this, he deserves our thanks and gratitude. Possibly, political considerations would dictate greater caution in expressing gratitude from fear of offending the new holder of office. But a person must always be given the benefit of the doubt. The new president will acknowledge the obligation to render recognition and thanks for the good accomplished, especially when the good was of such paramount importance as the prevention of war. A note of caution. The above acknowledgement is in no way to be construed as a retraction from my previous stand concerning the Camp David Accords. I reiterate as strongly as possible that it was and remains a disaster, a peril for Jews and for the rest of the world. The President's part in the Accords was no doubt motivated by the hope that it would bring peace, and for this, for the intention, he is to be commended. But the fact remains that all that has been achieved is that one side has made numerous concessions, including giving up land and essential oil supplies for no substantive return whatsoever. Such concessions merely prompt demands for further concessions, creating a greater danger to peace. But to return to our main point, notwithstanding any errors made or the fact that he cannot now expect any reciprocal favors, we are told by Torah to express gratitude where credit is due. This is a man who safeguarded the well-being of millions of Americans, and to him we express our gratitude. While presidents can and do change, the office of the presidency remains constant. The beginning of a new term of office must elicit even more vigorous efforts on the part of the new president in the discharge of his responsibilities. The first and foremost duty is to strengthen the basis of our very existence. And that basis is stated on every dollar bill printed in the USA and is the foundation upon which the country was born. In God we trust. There are, however, various words which roughly express the same meaning as trust, for example, belief or faith. Trust, however, has a meaning which is more profound than mere belief. Belief in God does not always mean unquestioning confidence in God's ability or willingness to help a person in every facet of his life. One can believe in God, but not to the extent that one puts his trust in God. As in the business world, where assets are given to another to be held in trust, so too our faith in God must be to the extent that we trust him. We should believe that God is not remote, removed, or aloof 
from his creations, but that every detail of our lives are important to him and can be safely entrusted to him. This is one of the main areas in which the new president must invest special efforts, working to instill such trust in God within each and every citizen, ensuring that their conduct is proper and becoming to him in whom we place our trust. The only way to assure such conduct, to make it second nature, is through the proper education of children. In the United States, the state is responsible for the education of its citizens. It is thus the responsibility and privilege of the school system to instill in their charges, in their students, the knowledge that God is not only the creator of the world, but a being in whom we can trust. It is this knowledge which is the foundation for a life of productivity and decency. There will be those who object to this with the well-worn argument of separation of religion and state. They, however, base their argument on a faulty premise. Separation between religion and state is not, nor ever was, meant to imply antagonism or indifference to religion. Historically, the Founding Fathers were refugees from religious persecution and when founding this country sought to ensure that there would be no interference by the state in the religious beliefs and practices of its citizens. But there's no question that their intention was to safeguard against any form of religious intolerance. Today, however, separation of religion and state has been taken to extreme, if not absurd, lengths. Any attempt to help parents defray the costs of educating their children in the way they feel proper is met with outbursts of protest and condemnation. But actually the reverse is true. Such financial aid is not incorrect, it is not illegal, it is perfectly within the boundaries of the Constitution. In fact, to withhold finances from religious school is paramount to religious persecution. For it is the inalienable right of every parent to give his child a true education. And since in public schools one cannot receive any religious education whatsoever, not even the one stated on our money, in God we trust, parents are forced to build their own schools. Yet they are still required to pay through their taxes for the public school. And surely all excuses are invalid when it comes to the question of helping religious schools pay for the cost of non-religious components, such as travel, health, secular subjects, etc. Refusing to help defray the cost of religious schools, or at least to grant tax rebates to those parents whose children attend the religious schools, is thus a subtle form of persecution. But even financial help, such as that described above, is not enough. Every child including those attending public school, must be inculcated with the belief printed on our currency. In God we trust. This should be the very foundation of education, with each day beginning with a moment of silence, affirming our trust in God. Obviously, this is not in any way meant to give license to the state to differentiate between one religion and another. We refer to that which is common to all religions, a simple declaration of trust. This does not negate the concept of separation of religion and state, for in no way is this religious intolerance, which was the sole concern of the founders of this country when instituting this concept. All the above may be verified by actual experience. The best, if not only way, to train a child to be a moral and decent citizen is to instill in him the knowledge through a simple recitation that we trust in God. Such knowledge checks any temptation to do wrong and ensures that a child's conduct is fitting and proper. And those who automatically raise the objection of separation of religion and state do so blindly, without reckoning with the devastating consequences of a generation reared without any knowledge of God. The results are obvious. Today's adults, products of public schools, feel no responsibility to train or influence their children, resulting in the frightening state of our society. It is therefore imperative to instill in children the knowledge that the basis of our society and indeed of each individual must be the awareness and trust in he who is the true existence. And as noted earlier, 
This is best carried out through a simple declaration or thought by the children at the beginning of each day. And there is nothing better than those four words inscribed on our coins, which so succinctly sums up all that we have been saying. In God we trust. The importance of the above demands an urgency that must transcend the normal length of time taken to implement legislative action. Besides being perfectly within the framework of the Constitution and law, it is the foundation of the existence of our nation and as such cannot, must not be tied up in the usual legislative and bureaucratic red tape. No committees are necessary, no cost-benefit studies are needed, but instead direct and immediate action. American money not only bears the inscription in God we trust, but also a pluribus unum, out of many, one. This motto sums up the American democratic process. A government is installed when the many participate in free and true elections. The entire process of any election is the unity that will be its consequence. For once the majority has expressed its choice, even the dissenting minority must unite behind that decision. In the case of presidential elections, those who cast their ballot for a different candidate representing different policies must now, after the elections, accept the candidate, the victorious candidate, as their president. And the reverse is also true. The victorious candidate is not only president of the majority that elected him, but also of the minority which opposed him. He must fulfill his presidential duties with complete integrity, not differentiating between those who voted for or against him. He is the president of America, of all Americans. May it be God's will that this nation conduct itself in all its matters with truth, peace, and well-being. May all the above suggestions be speedily implemented, making a world truly fit for God's presence, the preparation for the final redemption through our righteous Mashiach. Note how even when the Rebbe is speaking about American policy, about government, about public schools, it is always connected immediately and directly to the coming of Mashiach, making the world a more godly place. Godliness is not pursued only in a synagogue, and it is not pursued only on a holiday or on Yom Kippur. Godliness is pursued in every possible way, in every area of life, in every issue in life. There is a godly opportunity. There is the godly way, and there is the ordinary. And the Rebbe championed the godly way in all things.